Hello, everybody. I want to tell you about this robot. In the last couple of months, this robot has been to an alien world to discover new forms of life that we haven't dreamt about. But this alien world is right here on Earth at the bottom of our ocean. Before I tell you that story, I want to give you a football score. Somebody told me people in Brazil like football. So it's only the halftime score, but the score is one, Mars one, Mariana Trench zero. Mars, you know, is uh, another planet, maybe lifeless, full of rocks. Uh, the Mariana Trench is the deepest place in the world's ocean and uh, doesn't have a robot in it today. But as I said, it's only half time. And over the next decade, you're going to see, see a series of uh, robotic explorations that's going to go to the bottom of this place in the ocean and tell us all about the wonderful living things on Earth that we don't know about. So where is the Mariana Trench? The Mariana Trench is in the top left of the picture here. It's near the island of Guam. And the Mariana Trench itself is a very long piece of the Earth's uh, crust, which is where two plates, two tectonic plates are moving. And where these tectonic plates meet, we have very deep places. And along the Mariana Trench, there are many little hollows, all of them very deep, one of them called the Challenger Deep is 10.6 kilometers deep, and that's the place that's the deepest part of the ocean. So in the last couple of months, we've seen a very famous expedition to go back to that Mariana Trench. Just how deep is this? Well, the Mariana Trench is deeper than Mount Everest is high. It's uh, twice the depth of the Matterhorn. And there's huge pressures at the bottom of this trench. You know, people say going into space is difficult. We go from one atmosphere to zero atmospheres. Well, that's not nearly as difficult as going to the bottom of the ocean where we go from one atmosphere pressure to 10,000 atmospheres pressure. This is a picture of a very famous piloted craft made by the movie director James Cameron. And James Cameron was also partially responsible for funding the expedition of the robots built by my colleagues, Doug Bartlett and Kevin Hardy. And together, two months ago, they went back to the bottom of the ocean. This is a very special craft. You see that right at the bottom, there's a little sphere. This craft is uh, a few meters high. Right at the bottom, there's a tiny little sphere that's kept at one atmosphere pressure. And inside that tiny little sphere is enough for one person. Or maybe it's a space for two thirds of a person. The rest of the craft suffers the high pressures that occur as the craft goes to the bottom of the ocean. You also see that it's the kind of craft designed by a movie director because it has lots of lights to take movies. And it's my privilege today to show you just a few glimpses of those movies taken two months ago. Here's a picture of that craft, the James Cameron submarine taken from the robot that I showed you just a minute ago. And because the robots and the piloted craft went to the bottom of the ocean at the same time, they were able to take movies of each other. And that's more fun than just taking movies by yourself. Picard and Walsh went to the bottom of the ocean in a vessel called the Trieste, a very large, expensive vessel. And that was only a few months before Yuri Gagarin went into space for the first time. And scientists in 1960 were very excited. We thought, this is the time for two great explorations, the space age and the time when we explore the bottom of the deep sea. Well, we were half right. We were right about the age of space exploration. But it took 52 more years before we ever went back to the bottom of the ocean, and that was accomplished by James Cameron just two months ago. This should be a little movie. Maybe you could play the first movie for me. This is a movie taken from the robot. And you see in the dim background there the James Cameron lander. And just a second, it should start to take off and move across the ocean surface. 
You see it's starting to move now. The light on the right-hand side of the screen is from a robotic arm that Cameron has set up to take uh, movies. And you see it kicking up a little dust uh, from the bottom of the ocean. If I could have the second movie, I'll show you a montage taken from inside the James Cameron robot. This is looking through actually an IMAX camera. If it's not 3D, it's not real, according to Cameron. This is uh, the little robotic arm from the uh, piloted robot, uh, piloted craft. And in the background there, you see the robot. This is the second pilot of the, of the piloted craft. That's a guy called Rod Allen, who didn't get to, uh, to do much driving. James Cameron wanted to do it itself. So you see the, the arm of the robot lying on the ocean floor. This is in a test about uh, four kilometers deep, not the bottom of uh, the ocean. So let me tell you a little bit more about this robot. What's it designed to do? This robot is designed to go to places we haven't been to for 52 years, and it's designed to sample life. It has lots of experiments on board, and I have to tell you that the most exciting kind of life is going to be viruses and bacteria and the protests protests that you heard uh, earlier today. Actually, there's only about 200 people in the world who even know what a protest is, and most of you are here today. So, of course, we're also interested in other kinds of life. And so, on this robot, there's a little arm that comes down, folds down when it gets to the bottom of the ocean, and it's got a baited trap in it. And this uh, trap is designed to catch any kind of new forms of life, whether they're invertebrates, or maybe an eel, or on favorable occasions, maybe a fish. I'll try to show you more about that beta trap as we go on. Like the James Cameron craft, these are completely untethered objects. There's no cable that's going down 10.6 kilometers into the ocean. This, this robot is smart enough to, once we let it go, it goes all the way to the bottom of the ocean. It can sit there for many days, do lots of experiments. And when it knows it's running out of battery power, it's smart enough to decouple itself from the ocean bottom and float to the surface. And hopefully, the ocean is calm enough, as you see in this test, uh, that we can go and pick up the robot after it's finished its mission. This is what the robot looks like uh, in the water. Uh, it descends very smoothly and quickly to the bottom of the ocean. To go all the way to the bottom of the ocean takes about two hours. Uh, it's a very quick descent. Uh, that's the same time as the James Cameron piloted craft. And uh, when these vessels have finished their work, uh, they let go of the ocean floor and they can ascend to the surface in just one hour. Um, this is quick by comparison with some of the older experiments. So let's talk a little bit about why we want to understand this ocean. This photograph is taken from the robot. It's after the arm has gone down on the ocean. The blue container there is to take a, a sample of water from the bottom of the ocean. Uh, it's able to uh, contain itself and adapt to the pressure as we bring it up from 10,000 atmospheres to one, one atmosphere at the surface of the ocean. And beyond that is uh, the baited trap. Now I have a question for you. What kind of food do you put in the trap to attract life on the bottom of the ocean? What do you think? What would you put in a trap? What do they eat down there at 10,600 meters? Yeah, you're right, it's chicken. <laughs> so we put chickens in the trap. Um, they're so hungry at the bottom of the ocean. You know, what do you live on at the bottom of the ocean? You're sitting there waiting for somebody to die 10 kilometers above you. When they finally die, they float down. You know, sometimes they get carried away with currents. Sometimes they make it right onto you and you grab hold of them when they die. In some of the other photographs my colleagues have taken, we see, see evidence of uh, big whales or maybe uh, uh, killer whales that have sunk all the way to the bottom of the ocean. Their skeletons have come to the bottom. But I have to tell you that uh, within a day or so, the invertebrates living on the bottom of the ocean are able to clean any kind of carcass that floats to the bottom, whether it's a chicken or a whale. 
Well, this is going to be a great story of exploration over the next 10 years. It's taken us 52 years to get to the bottom of the ocean. But I want to use it as a way of exciting you about the ocean. Let's just think for a second of all of the ways that we use the ocean. 50% of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean, these microbes in the ocean. So every second breath, you should really say, thank you, ocean. We use the ocean to transport all our goods across everything that Brazil exports, everything that Europe and North America imports. Most of it, 98% of it, comes across the ocean. We use the ocean to drill for oil and gas. We use the ocean to catch protein, fish. Um, but we tend to use the ocean for other things as well. And so in your coffee break and a couple of, uh, a couple of talks, you can go upsta upstairs here and sit and look out on the ocean. And like most human beings, when you come to the edge of the ocean, you'll stand and look out at the ocean. You won't turn back and look at the land because we human beings have always been inspired by the ocean. So it's covering 71% of our planet. It's owned by everybody and it's owned by nobody, but we really don't take care of it. And let's think of all the ways that we're abusing the ocean right now. For about a third of our fisheries, we're catching too many fish, an unsustainable number of fish. Even though it's the main protein source for more than a billion people in the world, it's still abused by us. We're taking too much of this bountiful resource. We're adding carbon dioxide to the water of the ocean. About a third of the carbon dioxide that human beings have made in the last 150 years has dissolved in the oxygen. In a way that's good because it's not heating up the planet like the other two thirds, but it's made the ocean more acidic. So everything that makes a calcium carbonate shell is having trouble excreting that shell. And if we keep going that same way, eventually it'll be thermodynamically impossible to have organisms with calcium carbonate shells. That would be the first time in 55 million years that we've ever had an ocean like that. We're doing more things to the ocean. We're making it warmer. It's heating up dramatically over the last 30 years. And it's expanding because we're heating it up like most things. When you heat it up, it expands. And that's where sea level rise comes from. So a combination of the thermal expansion of the ocean is about half of sea level rise. And the melting of the glaciers because of the trapping of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and other gases, are warming up the planet and melting ice that is currently on land. So think of all those ways that we're abusing our ocean. It's our friend, it provides its oxygen, but somehow we don't care, take care of it. I hope that all of you will take it as a personal matter, especially during these two weeks of Rio Plus 20, to know that the oceans are our friend, we should take care of it. Thank you.